Hi, I'm Krista Jacobson, headmistress of the Buddha Dukai, where we teach authentic ninjutsu and classical samurai bujutsu. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's the ancient martial arts of the ninja and samurai. In today's video, we're going to talk about how to use modern ninjutsu for self-defense. Now, the reason we're talking about this particular topic today is because I had one of my subscribers here on YouTube ask me a few questions and even made a video asking specific questions for self-defense. Now, I'm going to share all those questions that he asked and give you guys some uh, tips on self-defense, how to use a modern ninjutsu for self-defense, but I also want to go over some principles and strategies that all of you guys can use to enhance your self-defense training. Now, before I begin, I always give a shout out to all of my new viewers. So, if this is the first video that you guys have seen of me, my name is Krista Jacobson. I'm the headmistress of the Buddha Dukai, which means School of the Warrior Way. We teach Koryu Ninjutsu and Koryu Bujutsu, so the ancient martial arts of the ninja and samurai. This organization does have other areas of focus, such as reality-based self-defense, weapons training and tactics, survival skills, martial arts theory, thought, and philosophy, martial arts conditioning. If any of these topics interest you at all, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and don't forget to click the bell. I do post two to three videos every single week. So if you're interested in any of those topics, please subscribe, click the bell, and keep up with what we're doing. So today we're going to be talking about how to use modern ninjutsu for self-defense. Now I'm going to answer all the questions that this particular individual has asked. I'm also going to go over specific techniques, principles, and strategies that all of you guys can use as well to enhance your self-defense training. So in the comment section of a video that I made a few weeks back, an individual started asking questions about self-defense. He also posted a link to a video that he made addressed to me asking questions regarding modern ninjutsu and how to use it for self-defense. Now after I watched this video I did say that I was going to make a response. I just told him to give me a few weeks to do so and I made sure that I asked him are these the topics that you wanted me to cover. He then sent me a response back and this is what he said. Dear Krista, yes correct but actually it is more and encouraging to deal with laws of one's country and a way to stay out of trouble but still be within laws of one's country. Much like the origin of the ninja slash shinobi, the kama was already made as a farmer's tool, but needed no adjustment to be a weapon. How can we in modern times adapt the example with, for example, with a hot cup of coffee or smartphone as weapons? I, myself, is covered and carry weapons 24-7, Viking style. Even the shower has weapons. My overall point is that governments try to govern, but does not give room for the individual in any given country. So using ninjutsu, we can use everyday items for self-defense. I am aware that you have open carry in the USA, but here I have a hard time carrying a toothpick. Thus, I have to hide my carry here. That must apply elsewhere. Thank you for all your great videos. So basically what he's saying is, what can we carry to um, ensure more success with our self-defense. That's what he's saying because he didn't talk about hand-to-hand -hand combat or anything like that. He's, he's really focused on using some sort of self-defense tools, self-defense weapons, but in his particular country he's not allowed to carry the conventional weapons that most people carry here in the United States. So he's really focused on what can I carry to enhance my self-defense. So before we start talking about tools, I just want to make a quick point. If you're not training, then you're not training. So it doesn't really matter what tools that you're carrying. If you're not training in the martial arts, if you're not training in self-defense, if you don't have the physical skills to use your body as a weapon, it doesn't really matter what you carry on your waist or in your pocket. So you have to make sure that you're training. You have to learn how to fight. You have to learn how to punch. You have to learn how to kick. You have to learn how to survive. You have to learn how to win a fight. You have to learn these skills. You have to have these skills because if you can't use your body as a weapon, then it doesn't matter what you carry or put in your pocket. Now, all of you guys who follow my channel know that I'm a huge advocate for weapons. I do think that people should carry, if they can, if it's acceptable in their state or their country, you guys should be carrying edge weapons and firearms. If you're within an arm's length, edge weapon's going to work just fine. If the attack is outside of arm's reach and you can't touch them, you can't punch them, you can't kick them, your firearm is going to be your best bet there. So, you know, definitely I am a huge advocate for both edged weapons and firearms, but clearly in this situation, um, we're talking about a country and a place to where this individual cannot carry edged weapons and, and he can't carry firearms. So what do we do in that situation? Now clearly he's talking about ninja and he's talking about ninja tools and how the ninja used one thing and could apply it many different ways. So if you look at some of the historical records, you see like the six tools of the ninja written from the Shoninki in 1681 by Natori Masatake. And in the Shoninki, it talks about six tools. It has the Amigasa, which is a straw hat, the Sanjaku Tenegui, which is a three foot cloth, the Sikibitsu, which is like a stone pencil, a Kasuri, which is a medicine kit, an Uchitake, which is a fire starter, a Kaginawa, which is a hooked rope. Now those six tools that we see 
in the historical record can still be used today. You just have to slightly modify them to fit the situation in the modern day. An example, you're not going to run around with a straw hat, but you can wear a black baseball cap or a hat on top of your head to hide your identity. We're not going to carry a three-foot cloth or a Sanjaku Tenugui, but you could carry a bandana, right? And that also could work the same use as what you would use a Sanjaku Tenugui back then. You're not going to carry an Uchitake, but you can have a, a lighter, right? You're not going to have a Sikibitsu or some sort of like stone pencil, but you can carry an ink pen. You're not going to have a Kasuri with all those different medicines and poisons, but you can carry ibuprofen or some sort of medicine on you. Now, when you look at things like the Kaginawa or the hooked rope, right? The hooked rope is going to be something specific that maybe that doesn't really work for the modern day, but if you look at what you use a rope for, which is tying things up, binding things, things like that, in the modern day, people do wear belts, and if you do wear a belt, you can use the belt in the same way that you could use the rope of the Kaginawa to tie things up, to bind things. Now, I'm gonna use an ink pen as an example, but I want you guys to take this particular principle and strategy and apply it to everything that you're carrying, right? So an ink pen that anybody can carry, this ink pen can be used not only to write notes and all that, but you could also use it as some sort of a force multiplier. For those of you guys that don't know what a force multiplier is. It's something that's going to be harder than your hand and comes more to a particular point that when you hit a particular object, the force that you're using multiplies when it hits the target. I think all of you guys have probably walked up to a door and knocked on a door for someone to answer, right? But if you take the same force that you're using to knock on a door and take a pin and knock on the door, your knuckles don't indent the wood, but the pin indents the wood because this particular object is harder than the hand and it gets to a point, it takes the same force that you're using from your arm and focus it in a single point, which then creates more impact on the particular object. So no matter where you live in the world, you should be able to carry something simple as an ink pen and to be able to use that as a force multiplier in a self-defense situation. Now, they make ink pens that are made of steel and they're made for self-defense. Now, generally these kind of items I kind of think are a little hokey and I don't usually go down that road of like all these different hokey little tools that you can use for self-defense and things like that. But in this situation, I think it does apply. They do make steel ink pens, and it's just a normal ink pen, but it's made of steel. So when you take it, if I take this plastic ink pen that I have and I strike somebody with it, the plastic's going to break. But if I take an ink pen made from steel and it's made to use for impact, I can use it for everyday use, just keep filling the ink up. But then if I need to use it as a force multiplier, I can wrap my hands around it. It's going to help have a harder punch and I can use the tip and I can strike into a target and use it as a force multiplier which will then enhance my self-defense. Now the same concept is why I'm more pro a knife that folds rather than a fixed blade because I can pull a knife that I have to fold out but a lot of them have like a window breaker on the end, right? And you can use that if you pull it from your from where you're carrying it, you can use that window breaker as a force multiplier if the particular fight situation then exceeds more than what uh, you thought it would be after you strike someone a few times with a window breaker and use this as a force multiplier. If they're not back and then, you can then always pull the blade out and use the knife as needed, but you don't have to go and pull the blade all at once. You can pull the knife as long as it's folded and it's got some sort of window breaker or something at the end, you can use that as a force multiplier and then try to stop the situation there. But if it escalates, then you can go to another option, which is using the blade. However, the most important thing here is talking about Ninpo. Now, for the a basic understanding, it's kind of the higher principles of ninjutsu. So no matter where you go, you should always be connected to your surroundings. You should always know where the doors are, where the exit doors are. You should always sit in a way that so you could see any threat that may be coming. You should always be really, really in tune with situational awareness. How many people are you around? Who's carrying what? When you're walking down the road, you you should always be aware, if I step on this side of the road, what are the threats and what can I use as a weapon? If I'm on this side of the road, what are the threats, what can I use as a weapon? Everywhere you go, the situation changes because no matter what you put in your hand, anything from an ink pen to a knife, you can use that as some sort of a tool to enhance your self-defense. So even if you go to a restaurant, you sit at the table, you know there's going to be silverware right? It doesn't matter where you go, there's always going to be something. So you constantly need to be aware of your situation. What do you have access to and how can you use that to help enhance the self-defense, to increase your probability of surviving the situation when someone's trying to attack you? So when I'm teaching self-defense seminars, that's the number one thing I talk about is situational awareness. Be aware of your surroundings. Be connected to the surroundings. Make sure you're watching all the people. Who has what 
Where can you go? Where's the exit doors? Where are you walking? What can you use? What can't you use? How can you walk and position yourself in a way that maybe would put an obstacle between you and a would-be attacker? All these things have to come into play. Another thing that you guys to think about when you're just out and about and you're walking through the town and you're just, you know, having a good time and you feel like you want to buy a soda, right? Well, if you have the opportunity to buy a soda from a glass container as opposed to a soda from a plastic container, then you should buy the soda from a glass container. Now, I know those aren't really the popular thing anymore, but they are still available. So if you can do that, that just gives you an added uh, striking tool that you can use in case of a situation. You're not gonna take an empty plastic bottle or a plastic bottle that's you know halfway full of soda and use that as effectively as you could a container that's the same size, but it's made of glass. So when you things like that is what you have to think about. It's not just about what are you carrying as a weapon. It's what are you doing? Why are you there? What can you use in the in the environment as some sort of a tool to enhance your self defense? Everything has to come into play. It's not just what you carry. It's also what can you get when you get to the situation? What can you get when you get into the environment that you are? Now, there are things that I think you should absolutely not use for self-defense. People talk about car keys and you can take the car keys and punch people with them. Let me just, all of you guys who have ever said that, go get your car keys, stick them around and put them in your thing and then go to a heavy bag and hit it as hard as you can. I promise you, you're gonna hurt your hand more than you're gonna hurt the bag. You know what I mean? So, plus you're using the, the keys as a strike implement when the keys is what you're going to need to get the hell out of Dodge, right? Same thing with a cell phone. People talk about, well, I could use my iPhones for self-defense. I, I don't think that you should be doing that. And the reason I don't think people should be using car keys or cell phones for self-defense is just basic survival 101. One, you have to have a means of navigation. The cell phone is going to give you not just communication, but navigation. That cell phone that you carry is going to help you call 911, call a friend, you can use the GPS, you can get out of danger using it as a navigational tool and a communication tool. So to take your iPhone and use it as a striking implement, I think is ridiculous and it takes away from a very good tool used for what you're going to need it for. So you don't want to eliminate a navigational tool or a communication tool as a striking implement when you could simply pick up a rock and the rock is going to be a much better striking tool for self-defense than your damn cell phone. Same thing with your car keys. You take your car keys, you wrap them up, you start beating someone with it, maybe you lose your key, maybe you break the key, who knows what happens, but if you hurt the keys, the keys is your key to transportation. That's what you're going to need to get out of Dodge. You don't want to lose a means of transportation. You don't want to lose a means of escape. So don't use your car keys for self-defense. You know what I mean? That's your means of escape to get out of the situation you're in. And don't use your cell phone because you break your cell phone and smack it on someone's head. Well, now you don't have communication or navigation tools. So those kind of things that people talk about all the time, I don't think that those are the things that you should be using, you know, because when you talk about what would you use car keys for, you'd use it for a striking tool. Well, like I said, go get an ink pen, carry an ink pen, get, go steal ink pen, right? Because an ink pen or, or a steel ink pen is going to work better than smacking someone with the keys. You know, same thing. If you're going to use your cell phone as a striking tool, the steel ink pen, or if you can carry some sort of an edged weapon and even and then use the edged weapon as a striking implement, again, is going to be more effective than your damn cell phone as a striking tool. So, although, yes, I do think that you should be able uh, to use anything as a weapon, I think you need to be more intelligent about what you're using and why are you using it. So don't lose things or break things that you need to affect escape just because you're trying to, you know, fight some type of attacker. So if you don't have to use your keys, don't. If you don't have to use your cell phone, don't. Use something else. So today I didn't really talk about any specific tool or any specific technique. I just talked about philosophies and strategies that you guys can use and hopefully apply to your self-defense training. Now, if you like today's video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I do post two to three videos every single week. And if you guys are interested in authentic ninjutsu and classical samurai bujutsu, please check out my website at budodunijutsu.com. There you guys can see the seven traditions, the list of skills, strategies, and principles that we teach. If you don't live next to one of our schools, you can always join the Budo Dikai online ninjutsu dojo and start training with us that way. So thank you guys very much for your love and support. I deeply appreciate it. Until next time, take care, be safe, and good luck in your journey of Budo. Bye.